Uh, welcome everyone to the Australian Institute of Geoscientists Queensland Branch AIG ALS Technical Series talk for September. So on to today's talk, we've got Stuart Haywood from Kingston Resources on the MISMA Gold Project PNG, the past, present and future. Uh, a little bit about Stuart, after graduating from the University of Southern Queensland in 86, he spent the next eight years working for various companies through PNG in the Territory. In uh, mid-94, Stuart joined Newcrest where he worked on the Cadia and Cadia East Drill House and managed exploration throughout the uh, Lock and Fall Belt and the Larry Block, where he met a dashing young and intelligent graduate geologist uh, who looks a lot like me. Um, following uh, that, he spent two years as, uh, BH at BHP as Superintendent of Resource Geology at Olympic Dam um, around 2006-2008. He then returned to Newcrest, where a lot of people tend to do, um, and worked on exploration across Australia and the Murray Province and PNG, including the feasibility study for the Wifey Gold Clue deposit and uh, following that, the all body knowledge and processing improvement um, position at Lahir. From uh, early 2013, Stuart set up his consulting business, including working on Toka Tin Dung in Indonesia and co founded the Quarry Development Group. Since uh, early 2019, he's been with Kingston Resources, where he's currently Chief of Geologist. Over to you, Stu. Right, yes, we'll try from the top. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, bearing with us and uh, being patient whilst we work through the technological side of things. But um, Peter asked me quite a while ago to do a presentation on MISMA, but the time really wasn't right, mostly because I'd only just started work there and uh, we felt that it wasn't a good time to present until we had something that was worth talking about. And um, I'll let everyone just quickly skim the disclaimer. And what I'll do today is um, just give you a bit of an overview of where MISMA is, some history, a bit of geotourism, some of the corporate overview of who Kingston is and why we're there, and also an overview of some of the uh, geology and exploration that we've done. So, Misama is an island that is 600 kilometres east of Port Moresby in the Louisiana archipelago. It's got a long history and involvement with mining, and we'll cover off on that a little bit. And more recently, we've got access to 30 plus years of what I call recent geological and production data. The thing with Misama is that there's been a significant number of PNG nationals and expatriates engaged there over the years and we are in contact and keep in contact with a lot of those people to um, help us with the data mining and to uh, understand some of the opportunity pitfalls with the project. I've taken these pictures from a presentation that Trevor Neal did uh, in back in 2003, and it shows the flow of uh, discovery and development of um, the gold exploration and mining in Papua New Guinea. And you can see that Mislima was a second cab off the rank in the late 1800s for the discovery and uh, alluvial and colonial mining of gold in Papua New Guinea. It, mining was a bit halting in the uh, in kicking off and it was interrupted by the two world wars and the mining there the hard rock mining wasn't insubstantial and that uh, public companies were floated shares offered and uh, these uh, the similar some examples taken from Trevor's presentation and that um, there was a lot, a lot of activity on the island. And there's still remnants that we uh, can see today. The, um, the train here, there's a tunnel driven through a coroner's um, ridge line that we drive through today. In the latter days, Pacer uh, of the last major mining effort on the summer, that was from 1986 through to 
about 2004, where they produced 3.7 million ounces of gold. It was a 15-year mining operation. I first went to Messina in 1989, I think it was. And at that point, the Amuna pit was uh, only really just starting and uh, getting established. The mining focused on four open pits, being the Amuna, which you can see in the background here. This is Mount Sisa. And we've got stage six, the main Amuna in Ponawak and Kulamali can't quite see off to the right. The Wakanona is another pit which is not quite in this shot here. And Cobell and Mica, the Mica is being back to it here. The history shows that uh, mining seeds, uh, relatively, that's principally due to the low gold price in the land back the field of the Lords and West Browns. And therein lies what we see as the opportunity for the project. The, all the infrastructure was demobilised and the rehabilitation was undertaken and you'll see from some of the photographs coming up that um, the jungle has done a pretty good job at uh, coming back and, and masking the, uh, the old area. But the irony is that um, when I went and worked for Newcrest for the second time, um, I'd go through the Warning Books yard at uh, Lake and unbeknownst to me at the time, I used to walk past the old missile process plant sitting in their front playdown. So this is a shot of the, the mining operations, circa 1990-94. So this is the Aruna pit, Cobell and Mica. And this is the process plant at the end of operations, whilst they were starting to really hook into the um, rehabilitation. The legend has it is that the guys would start to um, work through an area doing the rehabilitation and the, the jungle was not far behind them. And this is what we see today. If you look at uh, Google Earth, and this is a, a satellite image, can just see the topographic forms of the Aruna over here. The Wattamona is a lot um, better hidden, and you can just see the remnants of the um, process plant down in this area here. And so, this is a, a shot from a drone looking at the process plant site back up to Mica and Cobell, and in the background is Aruna pit there. This is stage six pit from Red Point Pig Station. And this is Tonawak pit with Kulamala in the background looking down to Bodoya Airport. And so you can see that the, um, the jungle has done a pretty good job at, uh, at returning the, the site to a, a, a very well masked and uh, interesting site to try and get the Maker B across. So what we do for access is that we reopen um, historical benches and roads that, uh, that place are built. And the, the main access road, the hall road here, is still used to this day to get up here to the Luna East and across here to get up towards the Mr. Moore. Mining on Mr. Island today. It's principally artisanal mining, so it's from alluvials and some hard rock. Um, a lot of the workings are in drainages you know, around places like Winnemama, uh, Abikila, and also at the back of the Lunar East. And quite often, the guys have a pretty good eye for a good structure. And where we reopen the roads, the guys have gone on the targeted courts, laying the instructions. And uh, this is an example of um, coarse gold that they've been pulling out. And here's one very happy director um, with uh, a local miner from Guinea I believe. The super gene enrichment 
provides us with some rather interesting challenges that uh, can be confusing at times, but at least it gives us a pretty good leading to uh, new prospect areas across the island. So artisanal mining is the primary income on this one. And the other important source of cash flow for the island would be 100 or so FICO mine workers that um, go to Ongkedi, used to be a Fulgra, and um, Mahia rely quite heavily on ex Muslim workers. So here's some of the corporate stuff. Um, so Kingston Resources got involved with Mesoma in 2017 when they moved with WCB. And we have uh, two projects. We have Livingston Gold Project in the west in the Briar Basin, and we're currently doing a, a, an RC program there. And we're aiming to get the York Resource up and running in the next several months on that. But Missima is our flagship project. And what we're really aiming to do as a company is to be the next or very close to the front of the queue for, for a large scale gold producing gas at 80%. Now, so it's not, not an open museum. A, it's a project that will require a lot of work, but I think we've got a pretty good head start in that we've got a, a high quality resource. It's a brownfield site with a lot of infrastructure still in place that we can um, utilise in the development. We've got a highly skilled and supportive local community. It uh, never amazes me, never cease to be amazed that we can uh, hunt around for a heavy earth moving um, fitter to fit, fix our excavator, and someone will walk out of the uh, really pair of shorts and bombs and go, yep, I can do that. High voltage electricians, carpenters, all that. It's, all, all those guys are there. It is a remote site, but access is quite um, quite easy. It's been a little lot less reliable in the last six months, of course. And um, as we learned recently, is that the LNG shipping lanes uh, travel just out forward and head up through here, and head up to, um, to the rest of Asia. So um, we're pretty well, well positioned. And you'll hear us say that we will repeat the, uh, the approach that Placid has taken um, but what we're doing in that entire process is modernising the approach, uh, but still utilising that underlying technical data to frame and test the economics of the, uh, the, the project. And so that's based on 15 years of production. We're going to have a new plant which will replicate but modernise the, the placer design and approach. We're going to reutilize a lot of all roads, the port and the airstrip. A lot of the, the intent is to utilize a lot of the old camp areas and that um, all of this is going to be our, our primary job at the moment and that is to complete the PFS with the annual uh, annual reserve by the end of We've been doing environmental baseline for quite a while, and that's something that we'll keep on going with. And so this is another way of putting that for people who are a little bit more visual. And what we're working at at the moment is trying to get our teams back together and get our exploration manager back on site so that we can uh, get some drilling happening and some water going. <clears throat> in Papua New Guinea, the most important thing is you need community support, and you probably argue that that's the case across the world. 
the local member, the, the Honourable Henry Leonard, is a great supporter of the project because he and people like Patrick here, so Patrick used to be a, a, a bigger operator in the mine, are all looking for a better future for their young, young uh, folk. And what we're trying to do is establish a whole bunch of development and engagement activities that will start towards building those opportunities and also developing the young folk and the existing skilled workers to um, join us when we start to develop the project. Again. This is a really important number in that we have one expatriate on site. It's Andrew Howard as our exploration manager. Our technical specialists are predominantly from the mainland, but what we're finding is that um, there's geologists and geotechnical engineers and uh, metallurgists contacting us all the time wanting to come home. So that is an important part of us. Our strategy is to ensure that we've got a predominant international technical specialist workforce. And the vast majority, of course, are the local guides. And as I said, there's a whole mix of guides who are unskilled labourers right through to um, quite skilled tradesmen. Now, for some, some geology and uh, talk about what we in doing with their exploration and, and some of the outcomes. The thing about the east side of PNG, it's um, it's had a tough time. And that um, during the, the Maya scene, you've got the oblique convergence of the Pacific Plate and the Australian Plate and the good old Hong Kong Java Plateau locking things up, creating a little bit of chaos this eastern part of the, the, that part of the Earth's crust. The net effect of that is that you've had the Woodlark Basin opening and creating a rise on the eastern side of the Woodlark Basin and uh, just on the edge of the Popular Point of Trot. And so that was all happening through the Miocene and then into the Pliocene, the Woodlark Rift, is starting to propagate further to the west. And during this period of time, you're starting to get the uh, mantle-derived alkali intrusive activity and intrusions being developed on this arrival. And so these are the biomicrogenodiri. That's focused around Mount Caesar and Ports Mountain. You see that on the bottom of the map in a minute. It's also generated and, and structures and fluid pathways, which has been the locus of the fog control hydrogen dogs of the base building mineralization and the page dates of that is for 3.2 years. And the thing that um, Confuses us and make things make things quite challenging, but also quite exciting is that there's been a extensive super gene enrichment. Um, and this is uh, emphasized by the manganese wild base generated from manganocarbonates in your veins. And that's all happening whilst you're having this fraternity uplift. And um, a lot of that uplift has generated generated and, and caused our um, fringing reefs to now be quite raised above the, uh, the current sea level, anything up to about 400 metres. So the island itself is about 40 kilometres long, 10 kilometres wide. The west half is a high-grade metamorphic core complex, and that's interpreted to be a metamorphosed opioid sequence. Then where all the action is, is the eastern part. And this is a um, green schist facets 
uh, metamorphics of the CESA Association. And the strategic feed there is generally the lunar schists above the Alibu guts and the and the limestones and marbles, the R of greenstone and the liable patches. So those schists can be micaceous or carbonaceous. Intruded into that, you've got these microgranite diorites as sills and dikes, and then two major intrusive centres being around Mount Sisa and then Runa, and over here at Iwatanoma. And then we've got some uh, andesite volcanics up here to the north being the Gula formation. So you've got you know, volcanics here and then some um, volcano sedimentary rocks off to the west here. And I said it's had a pretty hard time. It's had various periods of extension and compression. We've got all sorts of deeds, plant structure and geologists get involved. Um, the isoclading holding green D1, so the S not and S1 are parallel. And that the granitic intrusions uh, post that initial deformation to send D2 and that makes for a very complex outcrop pattern with those um, greenstones and uh, sills and dikes of Granadara. You then move to a period of extension. That's the interpretation of why you've got this major through going structure here with west side down on the Luna fault zone. Uh, we tend to use the terminology Luna fault corridor now. But the gold silver mineralization is post that second deformation, but pre the D3 extension. But what we're seeing in the patterns is that there's been quite significant uplift and erosion and rotation of that signal one modification. Um, the mineral system model. When I went to, to Misimo, I spent a lot of time, the first four weeks going through 30 years worth of data. And um, my job was to generate as many targets as we can. And uh, my background is more along the lines of um, magmatic hydrothermal type systems. And what I was seeing in the data sets directly that. And so what we were seeing in the information was that there's an early porphyry style event where you get scarms, porphyry style veins and acid operation. And so overprinted by this later carbonate based um, mineralization. And you've got uplift and erosion heard because you've got your shallow level carbonate based metal style mineralization overprinted by uh, the porphyry style um, fingerprints and signatures. And there was a tendency to just explore for specific contacts and specific units. But what we were seeing in the data is that all lithological units are potentially mineralized and that you can modify them so that they will. Fracture brittlely to generate the, the crack breaches and the, the fracture zones uh, with the post mineralization. And the key to this is structure, 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 and plumbing, plumbing, plumbing. And that when you look at the island and you wade through the data set, there's a significant volume there, which when we throw it all together, it's corroborating at, at all levels. And so I tend to use at a regional scale, a bunch of geology um, pulled together by Benko. And that we find that at that broader scale, that that's quite a good starting point for our geos to go in and, and fine tune that. 
ESSA in 1996, I'm not sure if the date's online here, but um, Dave did a structure a compilation that when I go through and, and check and verify, it stands up to the test of time and, and, and that analysis. And for WCB, I was lucky that um, Ross Logan spent a lot of time super compiling a lot of the historical data and it gave us a really good starting point for specific um, prospects and targeting. And that a lot of these traces and linears come from field mapping and interpretation of the, uh, the geophysics. And I've tried to take a fairly simplistic approach in target generation because what I see is that you've got corridors of train track type north-south trending structures through here, intersecting with northwest, and I've interpreted these as being half parallel type structures. And then you've got a slightly offset sort of 110, 120 grid set of trends that are mineralized as well and that the the intersections of these north-south transfer structures and that parallel structures is where you get your major intrusive centres and your mineralised centres developed here at the Bruna, over here at the Ratamona, and up here at, um, at Missile North. And when you de delve into the geophysics data sets, this is analytical signal you've got some very complex patterns. And this is a reflection of your um, diorite sills and dikes being folded by these, these different tectonic events. And then you've got magnetic loads created by your hydrothermal fluid. And you can see that there's breaks, quite clear breaks in these domains. Um, we get these major two going uh, structural zones being the Luna, and then over here at the Wakanoma, there's this northwest trend that's quite important. And then when you take that same interpretation of those major train tracks, you can see that they do create boundaries and, and, and map um, changes in the, the, the geophysics. The other interesting thing that we've done is we've flown LIDAR, and that's half meter accuracy. And what you can see in the LIDAR is these really strong north-south grains coming up through here. They're less well developed here at the Wakamona. But when you track these to the north, and then when you track the Amuna Bot Corridor, which comes up here, and it intersects this north south, that's where we've got um, use of the north prospect. And likewise, over here at the, uh, so we've got Kulamalia, Tonawap, you can see a major north south trend through here. And we know that that's quite a significant offset. And so we use this underlying structural framework to um, start to frame our. our target generation in areas that we'll go and have a look at. And quite interestingly, is that once you dive into the detailed interpretation of your uh, geophysics data sets, you can start to explain a whole series of one and two and four point order anomalies which will require follow-up at a later date. Step four to the moon. So, a lot of people refer to, refer to the moon as the Amuna fault, the Amuna fault zone, where there is a significant amount of offset and displacement, displacement with west side down. But with the mineralization, I think that that's controlled by a what I call a compound structure corridor. And that all of the orientations you see within that corridor 
contain the components of all of the dominant structure trends mapped across this. And that what we're seeing is reactivation of structures um, during mineralization. And what we've ended up with, and this is a leapfrog model of the grade control, is effectively a wider distribution of lower grade material within which you get these higher grade structures. And you can see some of these structures in a Pomelac track pretty much right the way through there. And these trends are mapped into here and they also map and control your soil geochemistry anomalies. And it's most important in the Harvey Keeler, we um, went and followed up a couple of these anomalies with our brewery and uh, got some quite exciting um, results. But structure is important, but as you can see from this photograph here, it's also one of the most challenging aspects of uh, trying to work out missionary that um, everything is thrusted and sheared and dismembered and uh, therein lies the challenge of chasing up some of these good full hole hits that we've been getting. Uh, I'll show you some core from the Muna and the Waitamana. That's the most recent um, drill core that we've got. So remembering that at the Muna we've got an early porphyry signature. And so that's what you can see in this box here where you've got uh, chloride magnified scum cross-cut by porphyry style veins. And this is an oxidised scum at the back of Mount Caesar as well. Overprinting that within the main uh, base metal carbonate uh, portion of the deposit, you get a real, a real mix of, um, of different styles of branches that have uh, been sealed and refractured. This one's been solidified, and you've got base metal carbonate veins along the edge, and then you've got shearing continuing. Here you've got a uh, fairly steep dipping um, cross carbonate vein within a uh, meta basalt and greenstone. And then this one here looks it's pretty scungy, but that's that's mineralized. That's about uh, half to one gram material. And so you can see the remnants of base metal carbonate veins all through that. And so your, your picture from your grade control is mirrored in the, the diamond core in that the moon is not too shabby 20 metres to 17 grams, 78 at 2.7. And that's just on this one this one section, and so you've got this broad zone of low grade within which you get these zones of high grade, and that's going to be the basis of our reserve um, fluids. Some of these smaller structures that you see in the hanging wall on another section do tend to hang together, so we see that there's opportunity for uh, utilisation there. The really important thing is that um, we don't have enough drilling to constrain and um, to constrain that uh, interpretation today. In that we've probably only got about 10 or 15 drill holes in this area here, and we've really got nothing following mineralization down here um, across the central part of the rim and across the Kulamara over here. And so that's the really exciting thing for us. One of the challenges is that the aluminum here is partially backfilled, and uh, that's going to be an interesting um, issue to deal with in the one plan and the schedule. Quartz Mountain is the other area of focus, principally here at the Wakanona, and some of our new targets here at, at Arbicula. And it's lower grade and it's slightly, slightly different, but the same, um, in that you don't get 
the significant late stage shearing and, and um, I suppose early structure destruction and dismemberment. But the really exciting thing for us is that we can go into a new target area and drill holes on hole 43 here at 23.6, 2.9 from seven metres, pretty much at centre. So we see that there's opportunity in this area here to have a small pit similar to Cobol and Mica next to the uh, process plant, which we're looking to most likely to establish in this area down there. And so what you'll see at the Wagamona is that the uh, rock type is principally a diorite porphyry and that it's um, sericite, chlorite, pyrite altered. In some areas, it's a lot more strongly bleached, and that the mineralization is these small sphalerite, galena dominant fracture filled craterals. This, this, this hole here, so GDD 40, was a vertical hole, and some of the early interpretations of the Watanona were, I think, biased by the supergene zone in the uh, starter pit, and that we have an interpretation of much steeper dipping structures than previous interpretations, and that was important to get some certainty and meat around that in doing the resource update. There's a little bit of oxide here at the BWAC, so once again, it's just this uh, diorite. So we've done some funky things at the Wagamona. Um, what we've done is we've taken the blast hole data and generated some grade shells, linked that back to mapping that uh, Jim Sy and Yellow Stecker have done. We've also linked it to the surface mapping by previous workers and our team. And we've built a structural framework that we've then used to condition the, um, the grade modeling, the, the domain modeling for the resource estimation. And so what we find is that that low end of 0.1 to 0.2, you're starting to see one or two um, sulfide fractures to carbonate those metal style veins as the geological definition of that 0.1 to 0.2. And these are as fracture zones and crackles around the mineralizing structures. And so we've taken this structural architecture and conditioned the development of this 0.2 shell. And then we've done the grade estimation within that shell. The, the previous estimation was essentially um, less constrained and there was a risk of um, smearing and smoothing. And uh, at the end of the day, we've been up with the resource there. It was 7.5 million tonnes, 0.8, 200,000 ounces of gold. And uh, that had taken a more rigorous approach. Um, effectively, we ended up with a similar outcome for the previous resource. So what we need to do at EWAT is that uh, it'll be one of the early focuses of any mining operation and that we're looking to do infill extension drill there in um, 2020, 2021. So back to the corporate side of things. So what's our focus? We've got a three, should be 3.2 million ounce, or 3 million ounce of lunar resource and a two, one down here at Wakanona and that our focus really needs to be on resource definition and near surface mineralization. It's about making sure that we've got all feed to the mill early whilst we're setting up the focus. And so we'll be focusing at the Quartz Mountain area, which is UAP. We're going back and looking at Cobell and Mica and Darby. And we're also going to look at some of the oxide resource potential at um, Muna East Side and Kulamalia 
continue to think a little bit around the edges that will get sucked into it uh, when we get the cut back. Rissima North is still a prospect that we need to finish off, uh, but it's a little bit difficult to work there, and so we're going to probably focus more around the, uh, the primary mining production areas in the short term. And uh, that's it. Thanks everyone for attending, and um, apologies for the old ones and new tricks and technology issues. And I'll hand back to Peter. Thanks, Stuart. Um, excellent talk. Thanks very much for that. Uh, while uh, we're waiting for a few more questions, we've got a few there, but um, I'll be proceedings off. Um, you mentioned at uh, Umuna there was the carbonate face metal overprint on the early porphyry system. Um, what's the deepest holes you've got there? And are you seeing another porphyry that um, caused the uh, carbonate base metal mineralization? The, the deepest holes WCB drill, they actually focused on exploring all those portals. Uh, that was pre Kingston. And the guys drilled seven, eight hundred metres below the North Sea And I don't believe that you're seeing the porphyry that is the driver to or the source of the hydrothermal fluids for the carbonate based metal system. But having said that, that there's a, a rip roaring geochemonomy at Quartz Mountain, which has all the hallmarks of a nice awful uh, target, but that's really not on the books for us right now. It might be in about year eight to 12. Maybe. Okay, thanks for that. Um, question here from uh, Rod Dorney uh, What was the grade when place of finish? I think it was about. 1.9 and the bulk of that was super gene. Go dig around a bit and, um, and get back to the draw on that one. Making notes, I can't remember these things. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Uh, but, uh, what do you see as the potential exploration upside? Well, the exploration upside for us is that um, I've, I've been accused of being heavily waddle driven over the years, but I tend not to push a wheelbarrow too hard unless someone, if someone gives me new data and, and in terms by looking at things. And so we've come in and uh, taking the approach that any lithological unit can be mineralised if the ground preparation is right. And then what, combining that with the structural interpretation, we're seeing that the ridge and spur sample, which is pretty rough, it's really just sort of getting into the, uh, the general area of what might be the target. So you're seeing that those single point and two or three or four point soil anomalies do coincide with interpret structures and so for, for small targets I think there's significant upside there's filling the placer did with two and three grams at the end of the hole and so I think there's significant exploration upside um, outside of um, the usual filling in and, and poking around the edges of the existing miners the first step is that it is a pretty good way right now given the, the terrain um, and the development challenges to add to your resource and reserves base and improve the economics. So once you actually get that up and running, I, I see nothing but targets in the data for the time I go back to it. Thanks for that. Um, question from uh, Tristan Wells. Stuart, do you think that the modern day PNG is a modern analogue for the accreted Ordovician volcanics that make up the Macquarie Arc. And if so, do you think that tectonic reconstruction of the Macquarie Arc are likely to be representative of Ordovician conditions given the complexity of PNG tectonics? 
Oh, jeez, the big guns. <laughs> uh, I, I, I do believe that's correct in that um, the, the fundamental minimum systems are very similar and that the underlying controls are very similar. The orientations are quite, quite different, but um, I think that uh, you could draw that conclusion absolutely. Thank you. Um, question from uh, Steve Mason. Uh, um, you, how would you rate the cost of exploration on this market here this day with New South Wales? Pre COVID is the uh, <laughs> little uh, on that one. Um, our, our cost of per metre for drilling is quite expensive, and the big contributors for that are your logistics chain. We have to both convert everything to the island um, and diesel and all of our drilling consumers, our food, our people, it's, I would suggest it's about um, three to four times of the cost of, of doing exploration. And how would that rate compare to say uh, working on the mainland, particularly in the highlands? I think marginally cheaper in the highlands on the mainland, but the difference there is that um, uh, we're, we're on an island where there's at least a track system and we can um, mobilise equipment and people quite easily. Um, on the mainland, if you've got to use uh, helicopters, you can um, stand there burning up uh, 100 kilo notes pretty quickly with those. And so, it's, it sources the courses and it depends on where specifically you're exploring. Excellent. Oh, well, thank you, Stu. Um, we don't seem to have any other questions from the floor. So, um, on behalf of the AIG and ALS, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for spending your time with us and, and sharing us uh, the, the latest on uh, MISA. Um, and it's much appreciated. Um, so, thank you to all of the attendees and to Stuart. And uh, apologies for the technological issues, but uh, appreciate your attendance and taking the time out and supporting the AIG with these initiatives. Thank you, Stuart. Good night to everyone.